So I just want to kind of like start by talking a little about what the heck is psychosis. Um, and this is a definition from a, from a medical dictionary. And it's uh, a severe mental disorder with or without organic damage, characterized by derangement of personality and loss of contact with reality, and causing deterioration of normal social functioning. Well, really the essence of that um, definition is that it has to do with being out of touch with reality. I mean, derangement basically means uh, disorientation. Um, so, so essentially it's about loss of contact with reality. So I, I have a question for you guys. Um, how many of you are totally in touch with reality? <laughs> okay, so we, we've got one person there I see. It. I'm not sure if that's a grandiose delusion. <laughs> Um, but since, since none of us are really um, in, totally in touch with reality, does that mean we should all say that we're at least a bit psychotic? Yeah. Um, the cognitive perspective is that we're all at least a bit out of touch with reality, and, and nobody's totally out of touch. Everybody's at least in touch with something. And we just define psychosis as the point where that out of touchness begins to appear severe. Um, or, you know, maybe it puts us in conflict with the wrong people. So it's a matter of degree that we all have these kind of problems, but um, that, that it's a matter of degree. And also, it's an interesting question, who judges what being in touch with reality is? If none of us are flawlessly in touch with reality, how can we judge um, who's out of touch with it? I mean, sometimes people are out of touch with what we think of as reality, but maybe they're more in touch with what's actually going on at some other level. Cognitive therapy kind of like sees it all on a continuum, like where all mental problems have some kind of out of touch with reality component. So like a person with anorexia who thinks they're fat, you know, there's sort of an out of touch with reality idea. Or a person who has a panic attack and thinks that they're dying. Or um, a depressed mother who's taking care of her children under very difficult circumstances, and yet she thinks she's worthless. Um, psychosis is just distinguished by the extreme and socially unacceptable nature of the interpretations that are made. And, and also the cognitive therapist doesn't have to assume that he or she is totally in touch with reality, because the focus instead is on a collaborative investigation, you know, a dialogue where the client has something helpful to contribute, as well as the therapist. Um, dialogue's one thing that usually breaks down by the time somebody gets kind of far out enough to be labeled psychotic. Um, and that breakdown in dialogue also happens on a continuum. Like when our difficulties in being in touch with reality are just little, um, they just are kind of like little errors, and we have no trouble talking with our colleagues about it. You know, we, well, we might have had a little bit of poor information, or maybe we were just having a little bit of denial or whatever, but we can talk with other people about it and joke about it and that kind of thing. When our problems are kind of like medium, like maybe we're starting to have, you know, some kind of anxiety problem, at that point it might be hard to talk to some people about it, but we can still find trusted friends to talk about it, and if we want, we can you know, hire a therapist, and the therapist will talk with us as equals, kind of, about our problem, and, you know, work through it with us, not be too judgmental. Um, but by the time we've got a problem that gets severe, like what gets labeled psychosis, well, by then we probably lost most of our friends, and our family thinks we're crazy, and doesn't really want to talk to us about what we're thinking. And typically, if we go to a mental health worker, that person also doesn't want to talk about our ideas, about what's going on. They maybe want you to talk about well, what your mental illness is, or something like that, but they don't want to talk about your specific concerns, beliefs, and experiences. You know, schizophrenia experiences have been defined by a lot of the mental health system as being non-understandable, and there's no, this notion you shouldn't talk to a disease. Uh, don't talk too much about the hallucinations, that will just encourage them. Those kind of beliefs are out there. And so, the, the, the opportunity for dialogue gets kind of cut off. So the problem is, when we're really doing well, we easily get the social support we need to continue doing well, and we get the dialogue that helps us sort through things. But when we're doing poorly, we, we lose social support and the kind of ability to have dialogue about what's going on. 
So what you see is kind of a circular thing going on, where something that's an effect can also become a cause. I mean, getting isolated can actually be kind of a cause of psychosis, especially being isolated around a lot of people. Like they found that the worst thing is people who live in an urban area, but they live alone in an area where most people are in couples and, and families and stuff. Um, but being psychotic itself often um, causes isolation. Um, for one thing, the symptoms are often cause people to isolate, but then often people pull back from the person um, who's having the symptoms and don't want to talk to them. Even if they're willing to be in the same room, they don't want to talk about their experience. So this pattern of an effect also being a cause or this whole kind of circular dynamic is, is something I mentioned before, nonlinear dynamics. Or, um, it's basically positive feedback loops that can become kind of a self-organizing pattern. A key part of cognitive therapy for psychosis is looking for these kind of dynamics in a person's life where um, we're going to talk about it later under the part of the the talk called uh, the formulation. It's an idea in cognitive therapy. We'll talk about that. So rather than seeing what's going on as kind of like a mysterious illness, um, what you're basically seeing is understandable chains of cause and effect, even if they're vicious circles of cause and effect. And the mental problems um, that result um, often have a lot to do with this breakdown in dialogue that we're talking about, but cognitive therapy is about an opportunity to start restoring that kind of dialogue. Pretty much all of what we look at in terms of mental health problems have kind of like a, a too far out of balance kind of thing where people swing from these different extremes that you see here. So uh, the one on the left here is uh, what kind of therapists call emotional reasoning where basically a person thinks that let's say they have a feeling of fear and they pretty much just assume that means they're in danger. If I feel scared then it's, it's terrible, I can't go there. Um, and of course when people are caught in that kind of emotional reasoning their life can get really messed up because they can't go anywhere that feels scary. So then they often swing to the other side and think well my emotion is my enemy, I need to get rid of this fear. How can I just block it out? They try to block it out in their mind or they go try to get drugs to block out the fear. And those are two extremes, whereas the cognitive idea is, is in the middle, is where we're more like what health is. It's like we're open to feeling our feelings and emotions, but we don't assume that they mean true, okay? So if you feel fear, it might mean you're in danger, or it might mean that um, it's just a feeling, and you have to decide whether it's accurate. If the fear is not, there's no, the danger isn't really that significant, you just kind of have to go on about your business. Now, I'm not sure how well you can see this next slide, but this is a picture I took on North Sister a couple of years ago. And as you might be able to tell, this part of the climb is just a little precarious. <laughs> um, my sister-in-law asked me how I could do things like climb, and she said, well, don't you have any fear of heights? And I told her, well, I wouldn't climb if I didn't have a fear of heights, because, you know, I, falling is bad. Um, but I also couldn't climb if I couldn't reassure myself that I know what I'm doing and I'm actually reasonably safe. Now, you can't see that there is a rope in there, but <laughs> it's part of what's going on. Um, so the fact that I'm open to a dialogue within myself between I can feel the fear, oh no, I might die here, okay, but what am I doing about it, how am I making sure I'm safe, that's really what healthy um, you know, emotional functioning is about. Now, one thing that kind of disrupts that dialogue can be trauma. Now, we know from brain studies that when a person's overly aroused, the part of their mind that evaluates danger is essentially shut down.